Yeah, so hello everyone. I hope you enjoyed your meal and are not too sleepy because I would not, uh, I don't want to put you to sleep. Uh, my uh, presentation may get a bit technical at times. Uh, I see some people have already uh, prepared themselves with coffee. That might be a good idea. Um, otherwise, um, I was scheduled uh, one and a half hour uh, for this lecture. I'm not planning to be that long. Um, but if you need uh, uh, if you need a break, uh, I can make a five to ten minute break uh, after 40 minutes, and you can fetch some coffee then. Um, I also thanks uh, to Brina for the presentation, um, who I am and what I do. Um, and uh, I would just uh, like to mention. Uh, besides what she said, that I uh, provide um, advice free of charge uh, on data management. And you don't need to be an employee at the University of Ljubljana or a student at the University of Ljubljana or um, a member of our library. Uh, you can just uh, send me an email to the address shown here. Uh, I would also uh, prefer if you interrupt me while I speak, uh, because I would like to address any unclarities as they arise. Um, otherwise, there will also be time for questions at the end of my presentation. Um, so I hope this is it and we can start. Um, so I would first uh, like to start with explaining what a data management plan is. Uh, so a data management plan is a document that describes the data lifecycle. Uh, that means uh, a document that describes how data are collected, analyzed, formatted, stored, preserved, protected, licensed, and shared throughout the research process. Uh, depending on the data management template, uh, some data management plans can also contain uh, detailed information about the research group, project funder, etc. Well, why do we need a data management plan in the first place? Well, um, the most obvious answer is because funders demand uh, plans of us. Um, data management plans are required by numerous funding bodies, both inside and outside the European Union. And the rationale is that the research that has been funded with taxpayers' money should be made accessible to the public for broad sharing and use unless, of course, there are limitations due to security, privacy, or intellectual, intellectual property protection reasons. And funding is the incentive to make researchers actually do this. The second reason is that a data management plan helps you plan and organize your data collection. A data management plan will prompt you to start thinking about certain aspects of data lifecycle that you have probably not thought of before, such as interoper interoperability and um, reusability aspects, and to also learn about research infrastructure that brings you information, such as repo repositories. Case in point is EOSC that has been mentioned uh, today several times. Uh, with the requirements defined in a data management uh, plan templates, the funders can stimulate researchers to make their data more interoper interoperable and reusable in line with the goals of EOSC. And finally, of course, a data management plan can prevent many, many things from going wrong. A case in point, a lady from the University of Oklahoma who lost her uh, laptop with data on cancer research, uh, which was not backed up. Please don't be like her. Uh, OK. Um, I based my lecture today on three data management templates that are Horizon uh, Europe, 
uh, European Research Council and CESDA, uh, which has been mentioned before. So CESDA um, is a consortium of European social science data archives. And the first two templates are, of course, tailored to the requirements of the funders, and they are, I would say, verification-based, while um, the template from CESDA is um, funder and domain agnostic. So even if you are, uh, if your research is um, uh, not in sciences, uh, social sciences in humanities, but um, in uh, natural sciences and technology, you can still use their template um, if you find it useful. And it is what I would call data lifecycle based. I would also recommend you to prepare a data management plan for a project where the funder does not mandate one. Here, I um, what I have in mind here is um, especially um, Slovenian Research Agency, which to my knowledge does not mandate uh, data management plans yet, but I think it's only a matter of time when they also uh, start uh, because they are a member of the Coalition S. Um, yeah, so in an ideal world, a person would write a data management plan before generating any data, but I assume that most of you here um, are uh, listening to me because you already have some data and you need to prepare a data management plan for, well, the data that already exists. In this case, uh, sorry, I would start with step zero. This step is not in a data management plan, but uh, please get your files in order. Uh, find which of your team members, if you work in a team, have them, where they are stored, how they are named, which software is needed to open them, are they corrupted or not, and then clean them, collate them, harmonize them, um, and at a minimum store them on an external hard drive besides your computer. And even better, store them also in the cloud storage. If your data is not stored in at least two to three locations, it is not safe. Um, okay, so let's get to the DMP. Um, if you compare the three templates I mentioned, you will find out that they contain roughly the same topics, but just maybe not in the same order. And these topics are um, the basics, so the description of your research projects, the description of your data set, then certain aspects um, related to the verification of your data, so making your data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And then um, there are uh, aspects related to the costs and resources uh, for managing your data, safety and security, and ethics. It is recommended that you regularly update your data management plan, at least at the end of your project. For Horizon Europe, um, for Horizon Europe project th that last more than 12 months, this is mandatory. And um, this is why I represented this as a cycle, because you will probably go through several iterations of the same steps. Okay, so, so let's start with the basics. Step one refers to the essential information about your project and also of the data management plant itself. Most of them um, written here is uh, self-evident. So I would like to point out uh, perhaps some aspects that are not that self-evident. Uh, and I think Moitza already mentioned them. So uh, you need to, or it is wise to, um, write in this section which organization has the administrative responsibility for your data, which organization, or if there are several in a research consortium, uh, which of them own the data, or which organization owns which part of the data. Also, who is responsible for preparing and updating uh, the data management plan and making sure that it is followed. This is usually the project manager, but it can be a designated researcher. 
um, or a team member. And here I would also like to point out, due to different research cultures, that data management plans are a responsibility of researchers, not of department secretaries, not of li librarians, not of project officers. Um, <coughs> then, uh, okay, uh, what about the data set, step two? Um, uh -huh, sorry. Yeah, I skipped one uh, slide. So uh, the first question that all the templates ask is, will new data be generated or existing data will be reused? We are now entering the era where the funders are explicitly stimulating researchers to reuse existing data, not just general generate new one over and over again. Uh, so, if this is an option for you, uh, don't uh, be afraid to use it. And the SESDA template goes into much greater detail about data reuse. So, if um, this is applicable to you, uh, you, can, um, you can have a look at their uh, data template for reference, even if you are actually preparing a data management plan for Horizon Europe or ERC projects. Then the next thing um, that uh, you should estimate is what is the expected size of the data you're, you will generate. Now, understandable, this is hard to estimate before the project, especially if you're doing it for the first time. But what is it? Uh, why is this important? Uh, it is necessary for planning the needed data storage capacity. So both for hard drive or cloud storage, uh, if you use it. And you also need to be aware of the fact that repositories also have size limits. And in certain uh, research disciplines, such as, uh, for example, imaging and computer simulations, uh, that this issue is more pronounced than in others. And that. And to illustrate this point, um, so um, I would advise you to search for this um, this file uh, on Zenodo. It is very very um, useful, uh, especially if you decide if you are deciding for the first time where to deposit your data. It lists uh, the size limits of um, several generalist repositories. Um, all trustworthy and you can see that all of them have some limitations per um, uh, size of a single file or a data set and Harvard Dataverse also has limitations per researcher um, so uh, the size uh, of your data is an important or non-trivial feature then um, in yeah Please. Uh, so there is a restriction on the size of the data. Yeah. And at the same time, researchers are encouraged to read the data. What happens when, like, is there a deadline that a little bit later. So in general, I think that repositories, um, or let's say the, the general policy is that repositories are there uh, to preserve data for as long as possible. So in principle, repositories, especially these ones shown here, are kind of um, permanent storage for the data as permanent as it gets. So unless the researchers placed uh, certain restrictions on their data uh, for uh, certain uh, reasons that I will cover in justify the exceptions from openness, then in general, their data should be, should be always available. Except, I don't know, if some unprecedented event happens like 
I don't know, the servers get flooded or there is an earthquake, uh, something like that, you know, really, really an extraordinary event that would destroy the infrastructure. But even in that case, a trustworthy repository should have some policies in place um, how to preserve their operations. So, for example, they should have um, uh, a second location available, backups, and so on. So, in in principle, this I, I won't say that it can never happen, but it should not happen with with uh, trusted repositories unless there are some legal uh, legal limitations on how long the data should be stored. And I will get to that. Yeah. OK, um, so two more things that you should cover in uh, the step two are uh, data files and uh, data, sorry, data types, such as, I don't know whether it is text, uh, images, video, sounds, so on. Uh, and file formats and naming conventions and uh, the organization of your data. Um, these topics are quite straightforward. They are not difficult to understand, but they are very, very detailed if you really want to get it right. So I would invite you, if you are interested um, uh, in the practicalities, to visit uh, the website I linked here. Uh, it's called Diros Data, or you may uh, hear me say Diros Data <laughs> in Slovenian. Uh, it's a website um, that me and my colleagues uh, built at the Central Technical Library. It is dedicated to uh, research data, and although uh, Slovenian uh, URL is shown here, it is now approximately 90% translated into English. Uh, so everything except the event calendar and so everyone here could, should in principle be able to use it. Um, I covered uh, the data formatting there in detail. And um, the last thing that goes under this section is the origin or in other words the provenance of the data, which means who who created the data, what they created, when, how, and why. Uh, this, on the other hand, um, or for contrast from before, this is a complex topic to understand uh, and master, especially because it is tied to metadata schemas that I will cov cover later on. Um, and again, I would invite you to come to the website and uh, read the article on it because I don't have time today to uh, really cover this. Uh, this can be, could be a separate, um, uh, separate lecture in itself. Uh, however, I would like to uh, show you perhaps a little bit unorthodox answer why uh, data provenance is a part of the data management plan. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this. So in 2018, Google launched a dedicated um, search engine for searching data sets. And by now, it has indexed almost 25 million of data sets and gives you a single place to search for data sets and find links to where the data uh, are deposited. And uh, if, you, if you search for something, um, I, here I searched for the term battery. Um, you will also um, soon see why. Um, this is the results that you get. And uh, you can see that when uh, a Google dataset search retrieves your datasets, uh, it shows the accompanying information. And that is very useful for other people who are interested in your data. So um, it is wise to plan for this already in the DMP so that you remember to really to um, uh, in, um, include this information or information alongside your data. No? Okay. 
Uh, then the SASDA template has um, one more question that the other two templates do not, and that is uh, that you should uh, include quality assurance uh, at the data collection stage uh, in this part. There is also uh, a topic or question of quality assurance at the data processing um, stage, but that needs to be addressed under the reusability aspect, and we will get to that. Okay, so we are at step three, uh, findability. And the first thing that all the templates ask you is, will the data be identified by a persistent identifier? What this um, question actually asks you, uh, is asking you, is will you deposit the data to a trusted repository? Because a trusted repository, uh, I mean, a definition of a trusted repository is a repository that assigns a persistent identifier to the data. Um, and uh, I don't know how much you know about them, um, so I will just go introduce persistent identifiers to you briefly. They are unique and permanent identifiers of various digital objects, such as research papers, research data, other research outputs of non-digital objects, such as research projects and funders, and even books, you may know ISBN, even paintings, and also people. You are probably familiar with ORCID. No. Um, I apologize for this. Um, so they consist of two parts. One is unique identifi identification code, which enables differentiation between two entities. For example, two researchers who have the same name can be differenti differentiated by their uh, ORCID identifier and a service that locates the entity through time, even if the location changes. So, for example, the researcher moves or a digital object gets transferred to a website with a different domain, the identifier will still able to locate either of them. Um, also, um, one of the reasons why ResearchGate, Academia.edu, etc., that were mentioned before, are not recommended for storing um, your research outputs is that they don't have the appropriate infrastructure in place for long-term storage and can't uh, replace a service that provides persistent identifiers. Um, so I join here um, Moitza, my predecessor, uh, in advising you against using such platforms as your primary primary, let's say, point of depositing your files. I don't mind if you, let's say, duplicate your publications, store them, for example, in a trusted repository and then republish them on your um, profile, but uh, don't do it the other way around. No? No. Uh -huh. Okay, um, so here I listed some of the uh, pers uh, persistent identifiers, uh, the DOI you may know, otherwise are others are not so widely known. Um, here I would like to, to uh, address one more thing, that some repositories assign permanent identifiers to data sets and other digital objects by default. Uh, Zenodo is one of them, but also others, while others do so only at the request of researchers. For example, Slovenian Social Sciences Data Archive and also Fixture. And in the second case, it is done in a way that you require uh, or put a reservation on a uh, persistent identifier as you upload your data. And uh, of course, if you are given this option, um, we highly recommend you to do that because it will ensure the findability of your files. Okay. Then um, the next question, this is a highly technical one. 
um, but you will soon see why it's important. So what metadata will be created and whether they will be machine readable. Uh, what is metadata? Metadata is data about the data. And uh, on the one hand, um, so part of it is the general information about your research project, the authors, and so on. And uh, the other part is the information on the provenance. Uh, again, why is, uh, why is it important? Uh, and especially, why is the machine readability important? Um, because it enables um, website harvesting. For example, the previously mentioned Google search. Anyone who publishes data can make their data sets discoverable in Google Data Sets Search if uh, you accompany your data with an open standard, in that case, schema.org. Um, because this is, if you, um, uh, if you are, um, if you're not familiar with this, if you're doing this for the first time, um, this can be a bit confusing. So a metadata schema, uh, like uh, as shown here, uh, is a concept. Um, is a, let's say a defined naming of important variables and relationships between them, which creates a hierarchical structure. Uh, which in best case, of course, can be machine readable and executable. Here is an example of a metadata schema for plasma physics. And what it really looks like is this. So basically, it's a research code, although it may come with um, a more user-friendly user interface. So uh, this one I'm showing here was created to extract uh, information from chemistry papers so that they are more easily searchable. And as you can see, um, uh, this uh, metadata schema uh, contains, contains entries dedicated to the author, to the, um, to the title, to the author's uh, contact information, but also uh, to certain aspects of the experiments, such as compounds used, uh, instruments used, measurements done, etc. <coughs> and as data meta schemas are the main specific, uh, you should be using one that is appropriate, of course, for your, um, your research field and uh, a list of those that have already been standardized is available at this website of the UK's Digital Curation Center. Um, okay, so if it's if in your research field a metadata schema is not available, well, then you may someday need to um, create one yourself. No. OK, so uh, the next thing, uh, very closely related to what I was talking about before, is what disciplinary or general standards will be followed to create metadata. Um, so this is not the same question. This one pertains to so-called controlled vocabularies. So if you want to create a metadata schema, you first need to have a standardized way of describing things to avoid ambiguity. And here, um, there is another, let's say, aggregator of existing, um, existing vocabularies and ontologies that you can use um, uh, to search uh, for something to base your uh, metadata schema on. Um, unfortunately, this one is um, specific more or less to, to biosciences. Um, other research um, areas may have comparati comparatively fewer um, vocabularies and ontologies uh, available. And however, if you do um, decide to create one of your own, um, you need to be aware that this is, can be considered a research output. 
um, and uh, you can also publish it and receive credit for it. Okay, uh, then SESDA again um, has uh, some, some interesting um, aspects to add. So will metadata be added directly into the files or will they be produced in another program or document? So um, a good uh, practice is if you're using, for example, Excel files, is that you dedicate the first sheet to metadata. Um, now, if you're um, if you're you will be uploading raw data, you need to create a, a README file, a separate README file that uh, goes together with your data to describe what the data is about. Um, and here, your best option is to choose a repository which already adopts a domain-specific metadata schema and will lay out for you what information you need to provide. And um, this is another interesting um, thing. So uh, from the, the Horizon Europe, oh, will you include search keywords in your metadata? OK, so why would this be um, useful? So I would like to credit the um, article shown above for this um, uh, example. So. Um, if you, for example, enter the word battery in the Google dataset search, you get approximately this um, suggestions. And you can see that the majority of them refer to lithium ion batteries uh, and specifically to batteries for electric vehicles that in Slovenian we call accumulators. And they don't um, refer to the batteries for household use. Now, if we have a look at uh, all possible meanings of the word battery, we see that accumulators, um, lithium ion batteries, are just one of the possible meanings. And if you, for example, come from the social sciences and you uh, research domestic violence, then battery, um, uh, shown here, may be a completely valid expression, but it will not uh, it will not show up in the the search results because because it is not that widely used. And uh, in this case, it is advisable that you use an appropriate synonym. And how to come up with appropriate synonyms? I would like to show you uh, another Google's tool. This is Google Trends. And here you can see the popularity of um, search terms, also their geographic distribution. Um, you can uh, estimate the search intent of the people who use the keyword. So, uh -huh, OK, sorry, <laughs> those of you who don't understand Slovenian will not uh, understand this. But they refer mostly to lithium ion batteries. Um, and again, uh, this also confirms that most people who, you, who search for batteries, they uh, search for energy producing devices and not uh, domestic violence. Um, and, but OK, the data is biased toward non-academic um, use. And another useful tool is Google Books and Gram Viewer. Uh, here you can um, compare the use of synonyms. And I included this because we Slovenians would probably first think of uh, using the word accumulator, but um, you can see here what probably goes on in the minds of native English speakers. And although um, the word battery here is the accumulation of all its possible meanings, I think it still um, demonstrates that um, if you want to be understood, you can't uh, or shouldn't use the word accumulator. OK. So uh, now we are at step four, accessibility. Um, and here a question is uh, somehow repeated or overlaps uh, with uh, the aspects covered before. So will data be deposited in a trusted repository? What are trusted repositories? Those who are certified, 
uh, or they are even if they are not certified, they are domain specific and endorsed by the target research community or repositories that are general or institutional and have characteristics of trusted repositories such as Zenodo. Zenodo is not certified, I don't know why. Uh, again, uh, I can't go into details of this, so I would like to invite you to uh, read more at our DDoS data website. Um, another question, technical, unfortunately, covered by all templates is how will data be accessible? Uh, will it be accessible through a free and standardized access protocol? If you deposit your data in a trusted repository, this is a non-issue. But if you have a data set that is, due to previously mentioned uh, size limits, too large to be deposited there, you will probably need to keep it um, at an institutional server instead. And for example, Microsoft Exchange Server Protocol, depends on, of course, what the server uses, is not uh, open uh, and free and standardized. It's proprietary. So for some researchers in some disciplines, this um, question might be relevant. And then um, we um, have two quite um, important questions or aspects. So will access to the data be fully open or will it be partially restricted? And what will be the conditions to um, uh, get the access? Uh, on, as, we have, um, uh, as we have heard before, uh, under the Horizon Europe and ERC rules, openness is the default state for research data. And any exceptions from this need to be justified and substantiated in the uh, data management plan. So um, let's have a look, a brief look at what constitutes justified exceptionness. So uh, Moita covered this a little bit. Um, so um, either you need to protect your results because of um, uh, legitimate as interests or other constraints so um, this covers, for example, confidentiality, trade secrets, uh, security rules, uh, competitive interests of the European Union or intellectual property rights, then uh, protection of personal data, data under third party license. Uh, Moitza also mentioned this. So for example, you are using a data that uh, was not open and of course, you can't share uh, what um, the owner of the data don't want to be shared. And then I would list one more thing, which is not really an um, exception, but, but more a constraint. And this is large data. Again, too big to be deposited uh, to a repository which provides openness. Um, and this can be summarized with this principle that will probably come up over and over again through this uh, event, uh, which is data should be made as open as possible, but uh, should be kept as closed as necessary. So how, if you need, how can you restrict the access? One option is embargo, um, which means that um, you keep the data closed for a certain uh, period of time and then open it. Uh, this is mostly uh, appropriate for um, uh, protection of intellectual property. So for, for example, you keep the data uh, closed while the patenting process is in place. Um, and But do, uh, be, do pay attention because not all repositories uh, enable this option. Then there is the so-called right to be forgotten, and this is the answer to your question. Uh, this is um, mostly applicable in uh, the case of personal data protection. So you keep your data open for... Um, the time of the contractual obligations, uh, but then you uh, delete the data. However, in this case, 
uh, the metadata must remain, um, pro possibly indefinitely, because you need to still um, mm, prove that the data once existed. And then you can also restrict the access by physical or IT means. So, for example, you um, allow access only through a secure connection or uh, in a secure room. And just a side note that any publication uh, resulting from restricted data needs to describe the, dis the restrictions and provide all the necessary information for interested parties to gain the access to the data. Uh, okay, the last, the last aspect under the accessibility is whether uh, is there a specific software needed to access or read the data. Um, this is, if you think it's quite trivial, but not mm, all people would, would think of it. So if you will upload to the repository um, uh, files in a proprietary format, you need to um, uh, you need to to uh, provide the information which software is needed for the researchers uh, to open this data. Okay, now we are at step five: interoperability. Mm. This, um, the first one is, will you use established software, hardware, and computer code to collect your data? So th this overlaps a little bit with what I um, uh, mentioned before, but it uh, looks at the same uh, thing through the different angle. So this section is more about um, using established, um, let's say, tools and infrastructure. So how easy it will be for other people uh, to reuse the data you have created. Um, again, here will you provide any references to additional data or other outputs that could, um, let's say, give hints how your data um, can be understood and reused. And uh, this uh, last part um, uh, refers to the previously mentioned metadata schemas and vocabularies and ontologies, but again looks at it through the, um, through the lens of compatibility uh, and ease of use and not from the technical um, aspect of creation uh, of um, these tools. Okay, so uh, reusability, um, do you need, sorry, do you need any um, uh, break or should I continue? No, okay. Um, reusability. So uh, here all the templates ask whether um, or what the documentation will be created and provided uh, to validate uh, your data and facilitate their use. So uh, the point is here to make your data understandable to other researchers. Um, so as we have heard before, it is quite, it is not a trivial task to, um, let's say, describe this um, uh, in a proper way, and it, it can also um, take quite a lot of time. Uh, now, uh, the next thing, will the main specific standards be used to document the provenance of the data? And this is the third thing. It's not metadata schemas, it's not vocabularies and ontologies, but refers to the standards of reporting experiments that are, of course, different uh, from, from uh, research field to research field. Um, unfortunately, I'm not aware of a single uh, website that would aggregate um, 
uh, these uh, reporting standards uh, in contrast to metadata schemas and vocabularies. So if you are planning to use this, you will have to search for appropriate one um, manually. Um, okay. Uh, and then an important aspect also previously mentioned by, I think, both Moitza and Irina. So licenses are a way to communicate uh, what rights you give to other people to reuse your work and can uh, prevent many misunderstandings. Um, data are in general licensed with the CC BY and metadata with CC0. Um, computer code and software require separate licenses, such as uh, GNU, Apache, MIT, and so on. And again, for more information, I would invite you to read the DIRUS data website. Um, and here uh, we have the previously mentioned data quality assurance at the post collection or um, analysis stage. And um, another very interesting and important uh, aspect um, brought up by CESDA. So what will be your strategy for versioning your data files? Um, so why is this important? Because if other researchers don't, um, are not aware of several versions of your files, I mean, they are not aware that several versions um, exist or how they differ, uh, they may use one that is deprecated and, of course, then, I don't know, maybe some, some methodology is obsolete, some data are obsolete, and so on. It is good to be clear uh, about the, the final version of your output, whatever that output is. And um, another interesting aspect, how sh the data should be cited when reused. Um, and again, if you are depositing your data to uh, a trusted repository, this is a non-issue because most repositories, um, they already provide pre-made uh, citations that you can export in whatever um, citation style you want. Not all of them, those uh, major generalist repositories do, but uh, let's have a look at the um, uh, at an example that Moitza previously mentioned. So um, this is the citizen science project uh, where um, volunteers were given uh, sensors to record um, uh, traffic uh, in Ljubljana and other European, some other European cities. These are data for Ljubljana. And this is how the data was uh, presented as an interactive website, which is, um, of course, very uh, appropriate because this data is also um, continuously updated. So you can see the traffic in real time. And um, if the researchers would want to extract this as some, I don't know, uh, Excel spreadsheets, it would um, uh, it would lose many many uh, of the all of co of course of the interaction um, interactivity and also um, some of the usability aspects. But uh, what happened? Mm, I was contacted by uh, the author of this, who found out that uh, another research group uh, reused their data. Of course, this was their right because the data was uh, publicly um, uh, available on the internet. But the author f thought that how they uh, reused the data, how they interpret it, and how they cite it, their data was not appropriate. Uh, however, they, the authors did not provide any references on their uh, website how other users should do that. So with some back and forth, then I guided her through the process, but I want to say that uh, it was a nasty, let's say, a nasty professional conflict behind it. 
So uh, if you have such a special case, it is very useful to include uh, data, let's say data reusability statement, including uh, the citation um, uh, guidelines uh, together with your data. Okay, uh, we are now uh, heading towards the conclusion of my presentation. Um, step seven, costs and resources. Um, here you describe the anticipated uh, direct and indirect costs for making your data um, fair. Uh, and of course, how they will be covered. Here, I would like to mention that in the European, within the European um, projects, uh, data management is an eligible cost uh, that you can cover with project funds. Uh, then uh, here, if you have not done so at the beginning, you can um, write here who will be responsible for data management and how will long-term preservation be ensured. Um, so again, trusted repositories are your best choice, but not all of them are free of charge. And for some data, as we have heard um, the repositories are not an option because of uh, 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 size limits. So here you should provide an explanation of what you will do in this case if uh, the repositories are not an option for you. Um, I kind of like this question. This one is from the ERC template. Uh, what is the potential value of long-term data preservation? I must admit that I don't quite understand what the um, authors meant by this, but maybe um, my interpretation is that what is the, uh, let's say, the potential value of your data for the society, um, providing that, um, I mean, you have already generated some data which means that other researchers don't need to do that. They can conserve resources and build upon the exist existing data, of course, if the data is sufficient quality. Um, then we have data safety and security. Um, quite, I would say, straightforward. Um, how data safety and security will be ensured, uh, again, Trusted repositories, your best bet. And perhaps um, I've already mentioned this a couple of times, uh, how your data and metadata will be backed up. Do backup, do backup several times. And um, another question that overlaps a little bit with the previous how will the sensitive data be protected and how access to this information be managed so if um, it you don't what I'm trying to say here is that you don't need to repeat yourself uh, do cover these aspects and cover them in the section of the data plan that is most applicable for your type of the data and your research field. Then we have ethics. Um, this is the last step. Um, so uh, here, uh, one interesting thing is that the uh, in um, the within the um, uh, European uh, Research Council projects, uh, the uh, aspect on ethics is not part of the data management plan. Um, they uh, require a separate uh, data management template just for that. Uh, in the other two templates, it's uh, a part of general description. So here you list any ethical or legal issues that can uh, arise and have an impact on the data sharing. And um, here you list also things like whether you need an approval by a, an ethical committee, uh, whether you need informed concept, consent, and so on. Um, 
and if there is any confidential information, so either from the legal aspect or from the intellectual property protection aspect. And uh, again, um, um, also the issue mentioned before, uh, how you will manage these issues with your other uh, members of the research project if you are working uh, within the consortium. And that's it. Uh, I know that my presentation was highly technical. This is uh, what the data management plan looked like, unfortunately. So I would now uh, like to ask you whether you have any questions or whether I need to repeat anything, whether I need to uh, go into greater detail on well, some of the things I mentioned. Yeah? Zenodo. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Huh. Okay. Um. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, uh, one thing we have to clarify first is that uh, it, because um, this is not directly, I think, connected to the data management plan, but I will answer your question anyway. So I would first, for also for, for the rest of you, I would like to clarify that in the uh, data management plan, you um, describe the process. Okay, so that's that's what the the data management plan is for. It's there for you to to think ahead of what you are going to do with your data, and then, if possible, to stick to it. Uh, what you are asking me, I think, uh, if I understand you correctly, is uh, the actual implementation of the data management plan. Okay, so um, it is. Um, it can happen, and I think you can't uh, you can't prevent this. That uh, your participant may opt out of your research when he or she learns what you're planning to do with the data. This is inevitable, and 
it happens, it happens. You will just get another participant that will be willing to to uh, participate under the conditions. I mean, everyone has the right to decide whether um, they allow the use of their, their personal data or not. The other thing I would do in your case is to uh, really get um, and if you if your research is um, uh, if if getting an informed cons uh, consent is an inevitable part of your research, then you will have to learn the legal uh, details. Um, I don't think there is a way around it. And once you do that, uh, try to present this to your research subjects as thoroughly as possible and as um, understandably as possible, meaning that they really know what will happen to their data. So basically, it is up to you to design the research process in a way that, on the one hand, you um, uh, meet all the legal obligations that you have, and on the other hand, to um, uh, to present these legal obligations to your participants in a way that they understand correctly what is going on. Um, I personally i my my background is environmental science and chemistry so i don't i have never uh had to to um uh, ha uh make my my research compliant with gdpr so i can't give you first hand experience um but um as far as i understand uh the data in the final form should not um, enable other people to identify your research subjects. Um, I personally would do it in a way, like also Moitza, I think, mentioned it before. Um, I would use an anonymization tool. And uh, so I... Um, either anonymize or aggregate the data or both in a way that it is still um, uh, still usable to other researchers, uh, but nothing uh, identifiable can be extracted out of the information. I would do that. And with the raw data, uh, I don't know, you know, the, the exact requirements of the GDPR, so where you store the raw data and so on. I would store the raw data as securely as possible. And if necessary, uh, once, the, once your research is done, I would even delete that data. So prevent any kind of, really to prevent any kind of, kind of un, uh, uh, unauthorized access. 